uh, separated yeah, by the pandemic, but yeah, I think we have another way to make this uh, pandemic time productive and one of the uh, way to uh, to maximize our time is to have this uh, SL Dream Summer School and I hope you have this, uh, uh, you find that this uh, uh, event uh, will add some uh, new knowledge to you and we will have a fruitful discussion by the end of our presentation. And uh, let me introduce myself first. So my name is Danny Pugulaksono and I'm a lecturer in Department of Geodetic Engineering in Yogyakarta, Indonesia. And as you can see that my field of study is in geoinformatics and web-based GIS. And I also uh, study about uh, 3D modeling and visualization for my master degree. And then uh, the last one is structure formation or uh, probably you can, uh, you will identify if I uh, mentioned that it is about uh, drones, how we process uh, information from a photo into a 3D model or visualization. So this is a very short introduction and uh, I would like to say that we should not be limited by this uh, limited time and uh, should you want to contact me, you can find my uh, contact at the uh, bottom left of this uh, screen. Okay. So uh, let me start my uh, materials today by asking you uh, this question. Uh, what would you get when you try to uh, Google? Yeah, so this Google is now uh, another thought. Uh, what, you, what would you get when you try to Google a Belgian farmer? So anyone can uh, open their laptop or their uh, 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 cell phone and uh, try to uh, search this one, a Belgian farmer in their uh, Google <clears throat> uh, search engine or any other search engine uh, as a matter of fact. So this is not, uh, probably this is not something you would uh, see. And I'd like to show you uh, what my search earlier uh, resulted. So this is uh, how I search into Google. Yeah, what's with the Belgian farmer anyway? So, uh, Last May, uh, in uh, probably uh, fourth May 2021, a Belgian farmer, an unfortunate one, was annoyed, was annoyed with a stone that stands in his way, uh, in his uh, tractor way, uh, in his private land. And then uh, he uh, dug up the stone and then moved the stone uh, about uh, 200 meters away. And accidentally, he annexed France in the process. So uh, by moving the uh, stone, uh, this uh, yeah stone, just uh, something like this. Yeah, here's your culprit. Uh, this stone with uh, 18, 19 uh, markings on it. Yeah, the, the farmer think that this is uh, nothing special. So he just uh, dug up the stone and then move it uh, someplace else. And accidentally he annexed, yeah he moved the border between Belgium and France. So yeah, we can say that uh, the stone is the victim, but yeah, we can uh, have a lot of um, a discussion on this one, especially about today. So I'm going to talk about how uh, geospatial technology related to yeah, this incident and how uh, this uh, pretty small incident, yeah, pretty small incident, but uh, this could, this have a potential into a war, <laughs> turn into a war, which luckily it doesn't turn into uh, one. Yeah, uh, there's a lot of things that we can learn from this one. Uh, for example, uh, one of the news said that uh, the mayor of uh, Erkolins in Belgium uh, told CNN that we know exactly where the stone was before because the stone were geolocalized very precisely. Uh, so this is our, uh, uh, keyword for uh, this afternoon. Uh, we have this stone here, and then we have the word geolocalize very precisely. What does it mean that uh, the boundary have uh, these physical realities uh, in form of a stone, which mark the boundary between uh, Belgium and France? And then it also have another realities, which is uh, geolocation. And uh, I'm going to talk about uh, the geo, te geo uh, special technologies 
that we use to uh, obtain this uh, geolocal uh, uh, geolocalized uh, coordinates of this stone. So what does it mean to be geolocalized? We have this stone here, and then uh, we uh, Mayor said that uh, the stone has been geolocalized very precisely. So uh, again, what does it mean to be uh, geolocalized? So for example, this stone, if we uh, take this stone and then we have, uh, we said that uh, this stone is a physical realities of a boundary, uh, a physical realities which mark a boundary between two countries. And then we said that he is, uh, it is, I'm sorry, it is geolocalized. Then uh, we, to be, uh, to be able to say that this uh, stone is geolocalized, we need a reference frame and that the stone is located at some coordinates which was measured using one way or another. And uh, this is what I'm going to discuss. So how do we uh, convert these uh, physical realities into an abstract, uh, an abstract which is uh, these uh, coordinates which we can see. So we are not just walking around in uh, our home or we get out to the street and we can see uh, the coordinates laying there. Yeah, uh, the coordinate is a concept which is uh, not a physical reality, but we can uh, we can uh, build something, some monuments to uh, realize this uh, concept. And uh, to have the so-called location, we need to define some kind of references uh, to say that uh, I am uh, sitting in front of a computer. Uh, I'm sitting right in front of a computer, then we need to define that we uh, are relatively uh, situated in front of the computer, which in this case, the computer is the reference. So in order to say that we, uh, that something is localized, uh, something is geolocalized or something is, uh, something have uh, coordinates or something is uh, situated uh, in front of the other, we need some kind of uh, references and in uh, geospatial technologies, we have a coordinate reference system. So I'm not going to talk uh, too much about these uh, materials. Uh, I'm just going to discuss a uh, very uh, small uh, material about this uh, geospatial technology. But let me say that uh, this uh, coordinate reference system is what made our world into what it is today. Because uh, when we say it about, when we talk about the border between Belgium and France, we can find that uh, there are maps which uh, indicates the location of uh, boundary between the, both the countries in form of a point, yeah, boundary point. And then uh, the uh, stone or the point have coordinates. And then uh, these coordinates, of course, we uh, have a coordinate reference system, which uh, probably one of them, which is, uh, uh, the most known or the most popular are uh, geographic reference system. There are also all the uh, coordinate reference system, of course, and there are many of them, but yeah, I'm not going to talk about them. I'm just going about uh, to talk about maps uh, and how do we produce maps to indicate location. So uh, maps is an, uh, a very old concept about modeling our world. A very old concept about modeling our world, uh, our uh, affinities around us. So uh, we can indicate location uh, in the map. We can measure uh, how large uh, or how long a, a river, and then we draw them to the map. We can uh, measure how uh, tall, probably a tree or a building, and then we put them into the map. And then uh, we can model the real world into a map, and then we can uh, derive some insights from the map. And uh, by saying that the map is a model of the uh, real world, I uh, remember the saying of Pandi, uh, the best way to map the world is to explore it because the best maps are at scale of one and one. So the best maps is the one that have the perfect uh, uh, perfect realities uh, like the real world. But uh, yeah, of course, uh, such map doesn't exist yet. Such map doesn't exist uh, because uh, about we are dis uh, now we are discussing about the geospatial technologies which uh, we use to measure and model the real world. So uh, in short, uh, the geospatial technology I am discussing today is something that uh, 
related to how we measure the world, how we acquire the data, and then uh, we model the world based on that measurement. And then we build a, a model of this world and to uh, visualize the result into a map or to another means of visualization. And uh, the end goal of this is to gain insights. Uh, we model the world uh, to uh, serve some purposes, for example, to understand the border between two countries, for example, to draw uh, the line between uh, province A and province B, and then, for example, to uh, figure out uh, the best uh, way to uh, probably to divide a parcel, for example, and then uh, this is a uh, real world which we uh, measure using geospatial technologies and then we model into uh, uh, maps and then the map is a representation of the real world. So there are many kinds of uh, geospatial technologies and uh, all of them all of them serve as an abstraction of the real world. So geospatial data uh, itself is a model of the real world. If we talk about a boundary, political boundary or administrative boundary, then it is uh, an abstraction of the real world. Uh, and then also if we have a street, we have uh, the uh, trees, we have the uh, buildings, we have uh, anything in the real world which we choose to model into our map, then uh, that is an abstraction of the real world. And an abstraction itself, of course, uh, uh, it is different from the realities and uh, what we are trying to do in uh, our discussion today is how do we uh, preserve the properties of this real world and how do we choose uh, the which uh, properties is uh, the best to be represented in, a, in our maps or in our uh, visualization in order for us to understand what the real world is uh represented by this representation and so uh, the business process of uh, geospatial technologies consists of these four uh steps uh, the first one is input or data acquisition and this is what i will be uh, talking about uh, much about this uh, afternoon and then the second one is pre-processing this includes how do we organize the data and store the data into a database for example how we uh, organize the name of the things in the uh, real world into a map, and uh, how do we prepare the data for further processing. And then the third one is analysis. We further analyze this uh, data stored in our, uh, yeah, we call it repositories. Yeah, we, we store the data and then we process the data to gain more insight. And then the last one is to visualize the data. So these four steps uh, underline many of uh, almost all of the geospatial activities and geospatial technologies, and it is not possible for me to uh, explain them all. And I will just have uh, some discussion with you about uh, probably uh, mostly about input, uh, the input, uh, how do we obtain the data? Like I said earlier that uh, the how we obtain the data uh, define how we present the data later later on. So uh, when we obtain the data with one means or another, then uh, we uh, had to make sure that our data is accurately represent the real world. Otherwise, we will have a wrong interpreta uh, interpretation of the real world. And this is what uh, this special technology have to do with uh, border uh, studies. Uh, if we can measure the border uh, or the physical realities of the border accurately, then we can uh, define and we can uh, provide the real uh, or uh, close to the real interpretation of the real world. And then we can have the boundaries uh, accurately and vice versa. If we have, uh, if we measure uh, the realities of the, uh, for example, the case with uh, the Belgium farmer, uh, a stone or the benchmark, yeah, we call it benchmark. Uh, and accurately, yeah, we measure with uh, some errors, and then uh, the map or the uh, visualization that we use to display this data will also contain some errors, and then it could uh, be responsible for 
future for another uh, disputes regarding to boundaries. And this also happens uh, in the past and uh, we can prevent it to be happened in the future. Okay, so uh, let me talk first to the, uh, back to the uh, very beginning about uh, probably the oldest uh, geospatial technology. And uh, I said here, one of the earliest job on earth related to boundaries. Uh, you might recognize the person in the left as uh, the president of the United States. George Washington, he was also a surveyor. And then on the bottom part, you can see some uh, surveyors in uh, the ancient Egypt, where, uh, as I said, this is uh, one of the earliest job regarding to boundaries. Uh, the uh, job is to measure the land, which uh, or the parcel boundary between uh, the owner of the parcel in order to uh, reclaim the boundary which was uh, swept by the flooding of uh, Nile River. So uh, that is one of the job of these uh, surveyors in the uh, ancient Egypt. They measure the land and then they uh, delineate a boundary for uh, the landowner so that a landowner could uh, have a record of his or her possession on the land. And then uh, there are also another uh, job of these uh, surveyors, uh, we don't know what, they actually called in the uh, ancient Egypt, of course. Uh, they also have the responsibilities to measure the buildings or the pump regarding to the deceased uh, kings or queen of the ancient Egypt. So it is a very uh, noble and very important uh, job in the past. And to uh, have this uh, profession is to uh, ensure that what they measure is uh, actually uh, related or actually depict or uh, actually represent the real world. So for example, uh, George Washington here, uh, one of his earliest job as a, a surveyor is to measure the uh, train, uh, Pandi, please uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, to measure the uh, route for a train crossing the United States and uh, this is uh, something that cannot have, uh, this is a, a job, a kind of a job that uh, cannot have an error. So uh, geospatial technology always related to accuracy, uh, how we provide a real representation of the real world while preserving the accuracy and other properties uh, related to this uh, real world that we model. So uh, for the first one, we have uh, the earliest geospatial technology, which is uh, still very important today, it is surfing. And we see that today this uh, surfing, uh, while having still the same principles, uh, is to measure the world and hence the name of our department, it is geodetic engineering, which means uh, to measure the earth. And uh, while having this, uh, the same principle, uh, the uh, technology regarding to, regarding to surfing, positioning and uh, to measure the earth is evolved also uh, with the advancement of technology in this uh, 20th century. And we will also discuss about this later. And uh, we jump to this uh, edge, we can see that we have a LIDAR, one of the geospatial technology to measure uh, the real world, which I said earlier, which I mentioned earlier, LIDAR is uh, 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 one of the technologies that uh, are widely used today. It is uh, light detection and ranging. So uh, the principle is the device which uh, commonly uh, uh, attached to an airplane, uh, the device emits a laser. So yeah, uh, if you like uh, Star Wars, yeah, probably uh, this is some kind of a laser that we could have. Yeah, the laser uh, emits the uh, certain wavelength laser and then uh, point, uh, pointed at the target and then uh, the lighter measure the distance between uh, the plane and then the target. And then we can uh, have the uh, coordinates of this point with a very precise accuracy. So this is one of the example of an airborne lighter. So airborne lighter uh, can be used to measure the earth and we can have a representation of this uh, surface here. Uh, and then we can further process the data into a map. And this includes uh, a physical 
uh, boundaries of probably uh, a boundary between one state or another or a province and the other. And we can also see that uh, the urban lighter can also be applied to uh, water. We can also have uh, with some limit the uh, lighter for uh, underwater uh, objects we can uh, still have uh, at some limit of course that uh, objects underwater and then we can also map the uh, objects that are situated underwater then uh, the output of a leader uh, of a leader measurement is called a point cloud and uh, aptly named so because we have a very dense cloud very dense points which uh, each point have their own coordinates and then uh, there are so many uh, of them and that it looks like a cloud. And uh, by having this cloud, by having this point, but we can further process this data into some other form of, uh, some other form of geospatial data. For example, this one uh, in our department uh, building in uh, Yogyakarta, we conduct a measurement using a point cloud and then we uh, develop a 3D model of the outdoor and also the indoor. So we also have the chair, you can see the chair and then the tables uh, in the class in this uh, data here. So uh, this gives you that uh, LIDAR is one of the um, uh, common way to obtain a very precise uh, geospatial data. And this is not only applied to something like this, that is airborne, but we can also find lighter in uh, in many ways. Uh, we can also find lighter on top of our future cars, uh, since uh, some of the uh, self-driving car company uh, equip their car with lighter, so that uh, the car could see uh, while uh, strolling through the street. They can see uh, an object, an obstacle, and then they can avoid the obstacle using lighter with the uh, similar or same, the same uh, principle like the one that I mentioned earlier. So uh, LiDAR is one of the technologies, it's a special technologies to be highlighted when we talk about how we uh, represent the real world into a digital one. And uh, this is definitely one of the uh, must uh, use uh, technology. We can also find a terrestrial LiDAR and this one is airborne and then this one is terrestrial LiDAR. Uh, uh, that we will uh, be seeing in the future when we'll talk about uh, geospatial technology. And then uh, there are also uh, Genesis positioning. This is one of the uh, most uh, used uh, method to define uh, boundaries, uh, physical boundaries. So for example, the benchmark that I mentioned earlier, uh, the uh, major uh, said that the point, the uh, stone have been geolocalized very precisely. So uh, it is possible that the technology used to local to localize, to measure uh, the position of the stone is uh, something like this. It is called TNSS positioning. So the principle is to have uh, multiple satellites to measure the distance between the satellites and the, and the station. And then uh, we can uh, figure out the coordinate of this point with a very precise uh, accuracy, very high accuracy. Uh, we can say that the accuracy is uh, at a range of millimeters. So uh, this is also one of the prominent technologies regarding to uh, how do we measure uh, objects, physical objects on earth. And then uh, by having this technology, we will have a digital record of an actual coordinates of the, uh, the uh, stone earlier. And then uh, we can easily uh, put the stone back to its original position based on this uh, coordinates. Although the stone has been moved, have been moved and then uh, or, or maybe destroyed as uh, happened in a lot of part of uh, uh, Indonesia, for example, we have a lot of benchmark which have been destroyed. And then we have the record, we have the coordinate and then we can rebuild uh, the benchmark, we can rebuild the stone, uh, the monument into a new one and then it still have the uh, same coordinates as before. And uh, the third technology that I like to discuss this afternoon is photogrammetry. 
So this is uh, also a very old uh, technology. This uh, dates back to the Second World War, where uh, people use airplane to uh, photograph uh, their uh, enemies, uh, the enemy space, and then the uh, area of the enemy, and then they uh, 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 conduct uh, the survey, and then they build a map based on the photograph. So uh, the principle of photogrammetry is very old, and uh, but uh, the technology lately uh, have been developed for uh, further, and then we can have uh, today we have a, a photogrammetry that is more robust, uh, faster, and then uh, it produce a result that is high is of a higher accuracy compared to uh, yeah let's say uh, ten or twenty years ago. So yeah, the spies back then could literally fly yeah because uh, the technological photogrammetry come from this kind of dove. Uh, people put a camera on the dove and then they ask the dove to fly to the uh, enemy's uh, territory and then uh, the dove came back with a picture. So the principle is the same and uh, people have used this technology to monitor borders for as long as photogrammetry exists, as long as uh, photography exists. And uh, this is not new, but uh, the new technology, then uh, if we combine this technology with something like computer vision, so uh, the so-called computer vision is a technology to process image in, uh, and then we uh, gain more information from the image. For example, in the picture here, you see, we can use the drone photogrammetry, we can uh, fly the drone and then uh, process the data that we obtain from the drone to identify uh, how much cars are uh, situated uh, in the border, for example. We can monitor also uh, goods or person uh, traveling across our border. We can also uh, monitor, for example, uh, ships uh, coming into our border and automatically detect uh, the ship or the uh, person or the, or the uh, uh, cars by, based, on their, uh, based on their properties yeah, from this uh, pictures. So this is what uh, photogrammetry have been implemented in uh, today's technology. We have drones that monitor the borders uh, in many countries uh, in the world. And then, yeah, something like this is not new. And uh, the algorithm and then the technologies regarding to this is uh, rapidly evolving. And we can see something else uh, maybe in uh, near future, we can see that uh, how drones uh, could be used for more uh, purposes than with what we see uh, right now. And uh, one of uh, uh, the point that I'd like to share with you is that photogrammetry is getting cheaper. So uh, back then, we only obtained accurate uh, photogrammetry using a very expensive camera, and then we only uh, flew the camera through airplane. And uh, of course, we need uh, some time to process the data using a computer that are not uh, an ordinary computer, which is uh, specialized for processing data. But today, uh, everyone with camera can do it. So this is uh, one of the uh, quote that I found on the internet. And they said that photogrammetry is getting cheaper because now everyone with camera can do it with uh, the newly uh, developed algorithm, yeah, so-called uh, probably a structure for motion or multi-view stereo. Yeah, there are a lot of algorithm regarding to how we process a photo from the uh, 3D model, for example, for overlapping photogrammetry. You can try also at your home. Uh, you can try uh, photographing objects uh, by uh, uh, 360 degrees around the object and then process the photos into a photogrammetry software, which are, uh, which if you uh, try to Google it, you can find a lot of also open source or free solutions to that. And then you can develop a 3D model from it. Of course, uh, there are also constraints which make that uh, the expertise regarding to this uh, photogrammetry is still needed. And, uh, but the point is that uh, now uh, the technology is allowing us to have a more uh, rapid data acquisition and we can have a more accurate representation of the real world. 
And then we also have remote sensing. Uh, I think I do not have to explain this one when we discuss about uh, boundaries or borders because yeah, what to explain when you have uh, an eye on the sky. Yeah. So like Socrates said on the left side, uh, we can rise uh, above the earth and then we can see what actually our boundaries are look like. Of course, not all of the boundaries are visible because not all of the boundaries are uh, identifiable by uh, physical properties, but uh, remote sensing is still one of the most prominent uh, technologies, so special technologies used to monitor uh, borders and then to, uh, to uh, yeah, I, I would like to say spy, but it seems to be uh, not uh, proper for this. Uh, yeah, monitor the border and then uh, to uh, gather more information about the border. And yeah, we can uh, have the eyes uh, on the sky and then we can monitor everything from the sky. So this is a uh, so-called remote sensing. Uh, we have, we are having the satellites, we are having satellites uh, above us who monitor uh, our daily activities. And uh, this is one of the recent image from uh, also a recent incident. Uh, to give you context, I will show you this. So this is a thousand of cars, this one. So this is the cars jamming uh, near the checkpoints of entrance of airports in Kabul, Afghanistan, since people are freeing uh, the country. Yeah, this is a very hot issue today. And we can uh, easily use satellite imagery to monitor uh, something like this. We can even count how many cars there are in uh, that are uh, waiting to enter the airport in Kabul uh, in Afghanistan. And so this is one of the uh, implementation, one of the uh, advantages of having the eyes on the sky. We can monitor real time what happens in the world uh, whenever or where, wherever uh, something is happened in the world, we can uh, also see what happens and then we can uh, have insights into what is happening. And uh, uh, one of the things is that we can not only see, uh, the satellites are not only giving us something that our eyes can see, but it can also uh, visualize something that our eyes cannot see. For example, this one, this is a, a SAR imagery. SAR is uh, something uh, radar. Uh, uh, radar band, so the satellite is equipped equipped with a radar band so that it can see something with a different wavelength than our eyes normally see. We can see that uh, the imagery could identify a ship, and this one is uh, could be used for border monitoring. We can also identify a lot of things uh, regarding to activities in our borders. And this, uh, and also uh, a lot of things that are not uh, normally visible to our eyes because we can uh, put a different wavelength and uh, into the satellite, and then the different wavelength uh, acts and uh, give a different information uh, according to what we want to see. So there are maybe satellites to see uh, the sea, uh, the dynamics. Of of the sea and then the satellites that we use to see the uh, trees uh, and then also for uh, the urban area and and many more and uh, there are limitless uh, possibility for this uh, satellite imagery to be used for our purpose and let's not forget about this ship that was uh, stuck in uh, Suez Canal uh, earlier this year so this is also one of the uh, result of the imagery uh, credit to uh, Capella Space. Uh, this is one of uh, new uh, players in satellite uh, uh, satellite provider, satellite data provider. So what you see is the stack of uh, containers in a very high resolution for a radar uh, imagery. So you can imagine that we can see uh, the actual shape and the actual height of the uh, shape and we can also see the reflection on the surface of the water. We can uh, see uh, through the container into the uh, uh, border of the uh, canal. And this is what radar can be used. Uh, radar can be used to uh, 
um, what is it to see through uh, some things like clouds and yeah something like this uh, we can uh, see something behind the object using the right uh, wavelength and we have this on the sky so yeah basically we can see everything and of course we can use it to monitor everything about what happens uh, down here in uh, the earth and also let's not forget about a uh, hydrographic survey uh, we can all we can uh, monitor the surface of the earth the uh, like i said earlier we have satellites monitoring our uh, border we have satellites monitoring our urban area but uh, the thing is that the sea is something else entirely so we can uh, we need to have a different technology to map the bottom of the sea and as pa andy mentioned in one of his uh, explanation this is a very fast ocean and our technology is still very limited and we only able to uh, obtain a small part of the ocean at one at a time and this is uh, still uh, a long way to go and the principle is basically uh, the same as uh, lighter that you see earlier we uh, beam up some uh, kind of a wavelength to the floor uh, to the bottom of the sea and then we uh, get the a picture of what is uh, underlying uh, uh, underlying in the bottom of the sea and yeah this is a still a long way to go and uh, a lot of geospatial technologies are now uh, related to how we improve the result of this uh, hydrographic surveying yeah, I could mention uh, some of them, for example, a robotic uh, USV, uh, a submarine, which is able to uh, get a picture and then relay the information from the bottom of the sea uh, directly into the uh, boat and then uh, at the same time uh, map the uh, floor of the ocean and then uh, produce the map to the operators on the ship. And uh, we can also, actually, we can also use a satellite. We can use a satellite to uh, derive information from uh, yeah, at some uh, depth of the sea, or uh, yeah, for this case, it is a red sea. We can see the text uh, under the water using satellite. Yeah, uh, in this case, it is ComSat 3. And we can see uh, at some level, we can see the bathymetric uh, properties of the bottom of the Red Sea, and we can have uh, an accurate uh, representation of this uh, bottom of the sea using a uh, satellite. So without having to uh, uh, deploy a ship, uh, we can also have the uh, picture of what is uh, underneath the sea. But uh, this is all, uh, of course, have uh, some limitation, a lot of limitation, actually. Uh, it only operates in uh, shallow depth compared to what our sea is uh, today. And uh, one of the uh, use of utilization of geospatial technology is to see the unseen. For us, this is a fast ocean, empty without any borders. But in reality, uh, the ocean is uh, the ocean have uh, so many borders that we our eyes cannot see. And uh, geospatial technology can help us to identify which location and uh, what uh, could we do with the location or uh, the, the planning of the ocean and then uh, what zones lies uh, above in the ocean. Uh, for example, we have uh, these zones, we have uh, underwater communication cable where the uh, fishermen cannot go uh, to this zone because uh, they could disrupt the communication uh, cable if they uh, conduct their fishing in the area and we maybe we also have restricted military area where ordinary fishermen are not allowed to enter and maybe we have the uh, originally permitted uh, fishing ground where the fishermen should go to this location if they want to uh, see uh, we, if they want to catch uh, fish and then uh, yeah Maybe we also have uh, marine protected areas. Yeah, we don't know what lies uh, underneath this area. Probably they have some uh, mermaids in there. So uh, this area uh, is it is not uh, seen uh, by uh, our uh, naked eyes. We cannot see the boundary uh, lying there in the ocean, but we can develop uh, some technology to help us to identify these uh, boundaries and 
Uh, yeah, actually, uh, back in 2016, if I'm not uh, for, uh, mistaken, Pak Andi, uh, uh, we developed something like this. It's called Inno Smart Sea uh, to help uh, the Ministry of uh, Fisheries and Marine Affairs or KKP in Indonesia to uh, for the fishermen to, to identify the uh, permitted location for them to conduct their fishing. And uh, yeah, maybe uh, Pak Andi will uh, have some discussion about this later, but uh, we, uh, maybe you can remember about this Pak Andi. And uh, this is uh, one of our earlier efforts to, to uh, visualize the unseen boundaries on the ocean. And uh, another thing is about uh, geospatial technology is uh, what I discussed earlier is about how we uh, obtain the data and then how we uh, store the data. But one of the issues is regarding to uh, something that is called geospatial knowledge infrastructure. So imagine that uh, there are a lot of information in our internet today. Uh, our uh, application in our cell phone already know, uh, for example, what our uh, favorite food, for example, uh, if you use to order your favorite food through uh, a food uh, ordering app, and then uh, it will mark uh, that you are a person, you are a person, he or she likes this type of food. And uh, this is a kind of a knowledge which uh, scatters on the internet and uh, the so-called uh, geospatial knowledge infrastructure try to to pin them all to pin all this uh, link data uh, with all the attributes and all the information into a, a single uh, portal of knowledge. So uh, I give you, I give you this example here. This is uh, one of the picture I took from the internet uh, about uh, the the top of Mount Bromo, and one of the top one of the tops is called P29. Uh, it is situated uh, right uh, in the middle of uh, two uh, districts in Indonesia. Uh, and then uh, in 2014, there are dispute. Uh, there were disputes about uh, the, this uh, particular point yeah, called the P29 peak, and the disputes uh, were uh, caused by one of these uh, statement here. So uh, the main boundary. Uh, of the reference pillar uh, said that the boundary lies uh, along the river. Uh, this is this one is called uh, Trete River in uh, one of the uh, district in uh, Java. And uh, the problem is uh, the local knowledge about uh, this river is different with the uh, uh, recordings that uh, on the old maps and then uh, the official recording of the uh, Trestec River actual location. So there are some confusion regarding to which one is the, the uh, mentioned river here. Is it uh, the one uh, nearby this uh, uh, location or uh, the one 20 kilometers away from this location? And what I mean with uh, geospatial knowledge infrastructure is how we manage all of this information regarding to position, regarding to uh, local knowledge regarding to toponym, uh, the name of a location, and then regarding to other properties related to uh, geospatial information into a single portal where we can uh, construct a query or we can ask a question about particular problem, and then we will uh, instantly get an answer regarding to all of this uh, information. And this is a next level uh, geoportal uh, this is a next level geo portal consisting of a lot of information. And one of the uh, obvious uh, implementation is for the border study. So we can uh, gather all the information related to borders, for example, between France and Belgium. And then we put into an infrastructure, a digital infrastructure, where everyone can ask questions about uh, the local culture and the old names of uh, an object lies in the location. And then we can also see the old maps uh, about uh, the old river, for example. We can also have the LiDAR uh, data lies in, uh, in the location, and then we can uh, extract uh, useful information, uh, geospatial information from this uh, single portal. This is what is known as 
uh, geospatial knowledge infrastructure. And uh, this is the elements. So uh, I will not uh, go further into the detail. Uh, you can see here something interesting is that real-time data processing and uh, dissemination. So uh, the uh, just personal knowledge information are not only related to uh, the data that are existing uh, in the uh, uh, our uh, repositories, our uh, database of knowledge, but also data that are uh, still generated by uh, the internet. So uh, we are now generating data by having these uh, webinars. Uh, you are uh, generating data by uh, typing into Twitter or typing into Instagram. And then this data is uh, also included into the uh, just personal knowledge infrastructure. So it is uh, knowledge into something that is happening real time. And then we can have a knowledge base, which is integrated into the policies, into the partnership and everything related to boundaries. And we can have uh, a single portal where we can uh, discuss together for example, of two disputing parties uh, or two disputing countries, we can have a, a discussion regarding to all elements of this uh, knowledge. Yeah, so this is only uh, an example, a glimpse of, a glimpse of what uh, GKI is. Okay, so uh, last I will uh, discuss about disruption. We have disruption everywhere, so uh, all of this is now every day, our everyday life, we have artificial intelligence. Uh, every day uh, we have uh, the uh, uh, Zoom that is interactively uh, erased my background here. So, and we also have uh, internet of things. We have uh, big data, uh, we have 5G and we have cloud or parallel or now it is called ubiquitous computing. We have disruptions everywhere and it applies also to geospatial technologies. We have digital twins where everything is connecting to, connected to everything else. We have uh, a car that uh, could speak. We have uh, something like this, uh, a smart access, this is a credit to Pandi, uh, a smart access for a smart city. For example, uh, we have this uh, bracelet in our hands and then uh, we can uh, put uh, vaccine information into the bracelet, and then we can, uh, uh, if we want to enter some place, uh, for example, a mall, then we only need to scan the uh, bracelet, and then, uh, about, uh, I'm sorry, uh, the, the bracelet will give information regarding to our vaccination status, for example, and we are allowed to uh, enter the mall, or we are rejected to enter the mall. Uh, everything is connected to everything else. So this is the concept of internet of everything. Uh, we have the computing power of uh, small objects near uh, by us. We have a uh, smart lamp, we have smart uh, bracelet, we have smart uh, cell phone of course, and everything else, which everyone contains location. And then we can imply uh, some rules or we can uh, uh, extract some data from these uh, objects. And yeah, this is uh, if we talk about everyday object, what if these things here, this guy here is getting smarter. So if we have a smarter drone, we can have edge computing. We let the drone to compute itself, whether this object is uh, uh, something that is important to capture or not, or maybe uh, we can uh, ask him to uh, go along a river, for example, we can ask him to follow someone we can ask him to deliver information that is not uh, imaginable for us today. Uh, if we have uh, the smarter devices, then we have a smarter decision. And also, uh, this is uh, one of the examples. So there are already a satellite uh, above us. So the satellite uh, could decide whether he need to capture the area uh, with cloud, uh, basically, uh, up until today, we are not able to uh, let the satellite to selectively um, capture the area if the area contains too much cloud so that we cannot uh, see through the cloud. But uh, now the satellite is uh, occupied with a brain, with an AI so that he can, uh, it can, uh, I named he, uh, so that it can decide uh, at acquisition time uh, whether this uh, area is worth capturing or not. So 
So this removes the burden for uh, clone processing, and this leads to a smarter and faster decision regarding to anything that we can monitor from the space. And uh, we also have LiDAR in space right now. It is called JEDI. Yeah, exactly JEDI. So uh, they have lasers and they are in the space. So this is JEDI. Uh, it is LiDAR, but in space. So with the accuracy and robustness of a LiDAR and uh, the advantages of a remote sensing satellite, they can see everything with the accuracy of LiDAR. And yeah, I think that uh, doesn't need any explanation. And uh, also we have personalized positioning. We uh, have this information, for example, uh, last uh, year, uh, there are some leaks of uh, 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 mobile phone data in Europe. Uh, the, one of the companies uh, obtained, uh, yeah, illegally, illegally about uh, the position of its user. So you can see here, uh, they record the foot traffic data of uh, individual person, and then they can uh, even uh, conclude that 75 people met on a train platform. So uh, the personalized positioning uh, are able to pinpoint a user or a person with a very high accuracy. And uh, this one is for the example of uh, tracking a COVID uh, spread uh in a community and on a train uh, but this is a scary implementation a scary uh, uh what is it uh, implementation scary uh scarier things that we have on how uh, our personal or individual uh, position are easily known by uh these uh, uh, companies and yeah, uh, we also have democratization of special data. I will not uh, go into detail into this. There are a lot of uh, democratization of special data already. Uh, you might recognize OpenStreetMap, but uh, let me ask you this question. What do these uh, two social media giants have in common in my slides here? Uh, maybe anyone can, can answer this uh, question. Yeah, okay, so you let me do the talking. Uh, the common things about these uh, two social media chains is that I do not have any accounts on two of them. Okay, no, just kidding. So uh, the common things about them is that they recently acquired uh, two different companies. The first one is Facebook acquired Mapillary uh, last year, and then uh, Snapchat uh, acquired Pixel 8, uh, a company called Pixel 8 uh, earlier this year. So what, what's, what's with uh, these two uh, companies? So we can see that uh, the business process of these two companies is about uh, creating a digital art. So this one is from Pixel Earth. Uh, the process is that you, uh, if you capture a video or a photo using your cell phone on your everyday walk to the office or to the office or to your home, you capture uh, something on the street and then uh, push the data into their server they are going to process the data and then uh, they are going to something called uh, co-registration. They uh, register your photo also with other photos of the area and then they uh, develop something like this. Uh, they develop a 3D model based on your photo alone and then uh, it can be used to improve the model based on the existing community, uh, community commodity uh, videos. So this is a living update of uh, our uh, digital world, our digital, uh, our uh, vicinity, our uh, uh, everyday life. We can post a video and then the 3D digital model of it will be uh, created. And uh, this is what I mean by uh, crowdsourcing data. So we are yeah, unsuspecting uh, people having the application, for example. Of course, this is not for uh, a paid purpose, but uh, if you are going to uh, have a 3D model of your location, you don't have to buy a terrestrial leader scanner, an expensive drone, for example, you only need your cell phone, and then you can uh, go and, and have a walk and record them on the video, and then the company will process the TD data for you. Imagine if everyone on the planet doing the same, and then we will have a 3D model of the world uh in a very short time 
Okay, this is just one of the examples of Pixel 8 are just acquired by uh, Snapchat. And this one here uh, at the bottom is Mapillary doing uh, similar things uh, from uh, the camera put on your uh, car's dashboard and then it acquired photos regarding to the location and then it can uh, produce something like this. It can produce a 3D point cloud of your area. And this is a, a creepily accurate uh, representation of our world. If there are a lot of people contributing to uh, Mapillary or Pixel 8 or Snapchat and Facebook uh, for this example, and then uh, we will have a 3D representation of our world, a physical world uh, into a digital one in no time. And there are also lighter sensor or hard on handheld devices. This one is on uh, iPad uh, 12 Pro. We have LiDAR sensor also on here, so we can uh, obtain 3D data of our room, for example, uh, easily without having to buy uh, terrestrial laser scanners. Okay. So another uh, disruptive technology for a boundary application is augmented reality. The goal is to visualize the invisible, so it is very uh, related to our case earlier. We can't see boundaries, we can't really see boundaries, but we can put them into an augmented reality and we can overlay them, superimpose the data into the real world. And then we can see something like this. Uh, this is Pokemon Go. And uh, for a more realistic implementation like this, we can see uh, the utilities uh, lies down beneath the street and we can see all the properties regarding to uh, this uh, pipe uh, or utilities underneath our uh, foot. And then uh, this, all these uh, things are situated in their exact location. So, for example, if we have uh, uh, boundaries, we have, uh, yeah, for example, a digital border, a digital wall, which we place into the augmented reality, we can uh, probably doing something like this. We can uh, visualize the border, we can visualize the wall, and when we uh, cross the border, we will have a notification that we are crossing uh, the border digitally and physically. And uh, last thing that I want to say is the metaverse. So uh, for, a moment, uh, for a moment, you might think that this is just a random picture on the internet that I took about a tree, don't you? So this is not a random picture of a tree. This is actually a comput uh, computer generated image uh, from uh, uh, a game engine. So this is a game engine recently collaborated with a geospatial technologies to provide a one-on-one -on -one, uh, scale of the digital, one-on-one uh, -on -one scale of a digital map of our real world, uh, which is called metaverse. So what if uh, we could bring you the virtual real world and we can uh, ask you to look around uh, when, uh, look around the uh, location, uh, probably to see uh, the boundary and to see other things that are not uh, reset when uh, where you are standing right now. So this is the metaverse where we collect the digital data and then we uh, present them to you into a, a digital rendering of the 3D, a walkable. And so this is walkable. If you walk to the trees, then you can uh, actually go nearby the trees, uh, a full-size digital world. And this one is uh, a credit to Cesium for Unreal. Cesium is a geospatial technology uh, company, and Unreal Engine is uh, uh, famous for uh, developing games. And both of this uh, combination leads to a very promising uh, technology. I'm just going to show you real quick. Uh, this is an example of what we can do with uh, this uh, kind of technology. We can explore Sicily without having to be in there. So this is not uh, just a virtual exploration, we can actually uh, choose to uh, go uh, somewhere and then we can see by having the virtue of uh, internet of things, we can actually see what is really going on there. For example, we can uh, experience if there are uh, rains in Sicily uh, at the moment. Okay, uh, I'm going to skip this slide. And yeah, so this is the metaverse. We can actually walk into a digital model of the real world, the one-on-one -on -one scale of the real world. And this is the process. I will not go into the deep 
uh, process the depth of this. But yeah, uh, I hope that this gave you a quick overview of what uh, just special technology uh, means for border studies. We can actually present the real world and the digital aspect of the real world. For example, the uh, the stone that we discussed earlier in our uh, presentation, uh, we can uh, represent the location and then the uh, digital border, digital wall around the um, uh, stone and then uh, the, around the benchmark and then we can present uh, and we can ask someone to run around the location digitally and vice versa. So we can uh, actually put uh, you into the digital world and of course, you can also put the digital world into you using augmented reality. We can see the border. We can see, uh, for example, the nearest uh, harbor and other ships, for example. And this is uh, one of the promising uh, aspects of augmented reality. We can actually see the unseen and then uh, to visualize the things that uh, are not normally visible uh, by our eyes. So I think in my, uh, the end of my presentation, uh, I just want to present the digital art vision, uh, approachable 3D version of the planet. Yeah, available at various level. So this is a vision of digital art by Al Gore back in uh, 1998. And it is very relevant uh, now. We have a network, uh, geospatial information, uh, especially the one that I mentioned regarding to border studies. We have a lot of information regarding to borders, the law, the policy, the physical uh, properties and then the uh, the history and and everything related to uh, these uh, data and then we present them into a, a digital version of our art and the last one is good for talk for your independent study uh, the art is dynamic and so is the physical realities of the boundaries so try to compose a, an an idea of an ideal uh, digital to special border what what does it looks like uh, on our dynamic planet, we know that uh, the border changes, and then the physical realities also change. The river changes courses, the uh, mountain maybe uh, changes its height, etc. And uh, is it necessary to, for us to have a digital uh, geospatial border? And then also don't forget this unfortunate little friends of us. And what do you propose on having as a solution to prevent? such unfortunate incident uh, to happen in the future. Okay, uh, I thought that that's uh, for me. So to conclude, uh, we are currently living in a, a borderless world where we uh, try to establish border as, uh, as, uh, uh, as uh, our capabilities to establish the border. Uh, we have uh, physical and digital realities and we try to preserve the digital and physical realities and just personal technology could help with that. And that's all for me. And thank you for your time. And I'm sorry if uh, I have some uh, mistakes during my presentation. Uh, to uh, Vincent, the time is yours. Okay. Thank you so much, Mr. Laksono, for a superb presentation coming from you. Maybe I can try to conclude several points from your lecture. Uh, the first point is data should be the reference to a coordinate system to be called a location and then abstraction abstractions of the real world are needed to convert reality into geospatial data using many methods of geospatial technology such as slider gnss positioning photogrammetry remote sensing and hydrographic survey for the needs to manage the border between two country two or more countries and then the final one the era of disruption is also affecting the development of geospatial technology. Okay, with the other we will continue with the Q&A session or the discussion session. This session will last for about 40 minutes. For any participants who have questions for Mr. Laksono, you can write down your question in the chat box and I will read out your questions or you can just you can just raise your hand and I will pick one of you who raise your hand and please open your mic. I can see Eriska Ginalita uh, raise uh, her hand. Please open your microphone and ask the question to Mr. Lasso. Okay, thank you very much for the opportunity. Hello, Pak Dani. 
uh, this is uh, something new ya. Yeah. You uh, know this for me about the geospatial technology. Uh, at the first time, I thought that geospatial technology is the same with remote sensing. Yeah, at the first time, I think it's the same thing. Uh, but you uh, have already explained that it is different, right? Uh, remote sensing and geospatial uh, technology. So uh, my question is, uh, what is the challenges uh, for a developing country to imply to impose this uh, special technology? I think that's all my question. Thank you very much. Uh, maybe you can answer. You can answer first, and then waiting for another question. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh... Riska for the question. So uh, what is the constraint, for example, uh, if we want to uh, implement the all of the geospatial technologies that I mentioned earlier? Um, uh, actually, almost all of that, uh, uh, the things that I mentioned earlier is already happening and in a lot of countries. So for example, remote sensing is already used on a daily basis to monitor the border and then GNSS is also used. I'm, I'm sure that uh, any developing countries already use these uh, technologies. And uh, for example, surveying, a very uh, reliable method to uh, define a boundaries is also uh, very uh, cheap. Yeah, cheap and uh, reliable for, uh, for developing a map for boundaries. And uh, the rest, uh, for example, if we want to uh, construct a digital world, if we want to, if we want to have a digital version of our world, and including the boundaries or something like uh, I said earlier, but just special knowledge infrastructure, yeah, uh, mostly the constraint lies on, yeah, for example, the uh, policy, since uh, we are now also facing the same things in Indonesia, so uh, we have now uh, a geospatial infrastructure information, but we don't have a uh, geospatial knowledge infrastructure yet. And uh, the constraint uh, range from the policy to, to uh, priorities of uh, the government and then to the uh, human resources and especially human resources and then the technology. Because uh, there's, uh, there are a lot of things to consider when we uh, develop something that uh, is uh, a larger scale, but uh, at present we have already uh, something, uh, some uh, method of measurement. Yeah, uh, each uh, institution already have their uh, data, their special data, and uh, the the next logical thing to do is to to develop a geospatial infrastructure. The, the so-called geospatial infrastructure is to uh, to allow each institution who owns the data to share the data. So in Indonesia, we know uh, we recognize this as a uh, satu peta or one map. The one map policy allows us to obtain geospatial data needed uh, from other uh, institution, which normally we can't have uh, without uh, a long process of uh, bureaucracy. So. Uh, that is uh, the first step towards uh, just person knowledge infrastructure and it is a long step uh, ahead but yeah we can start somewhere and i think uh, by uh, developing uh, and also uh, just personal infrastructure uh, information is already uh, applied in most of the countries in asean and uh, also in, uh, in the world so we can uh, already find that and then we can uh, have uh, um, advantages of this uh, infrastructure. Yeah, uh, I hope that answers your question. Thank you, Pak Dani. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay, the next one, uh, we have Prasa Fakriya Mutas. Uh, for Prasa, please open your microphone. Okay, thank you so much. I'm sorry I cannot open my camera due to some issue, but actually I really uh, interesting with um, marine borders, no day. I'm just curious about what technology we use, what exact technology we use to monitoring the marine border, and is there any physical mark like we use in land? We have benchmark um, to monitoring the 
uh, border itself or what kind of technology that we use to monitor it Pak, Pak, Pak Den. Okay, so uh, your question is about uh, do we have uh, an, uh, something like a benchmark yes. yeah, in the ocean, uh, like the one we have uh, on the land? Yes. Is that, exactly. is that correct? Yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, thank you, Prasa. Uh, so the, the answer is, is yes, we do have uh, some kinds of benchmark uh, in form of a buoy, yeah, for example. And uh, yeah, Pandi, please correct me if I'm wrong. I'm not an expert on this. So <laughs> we have buoy, yeah, which anchored to the bottom of the sea, and it marks uh, the location of some uh, points uh, on the sea. But yeah, uh, this is just uh, a single point and a single buoy on the fast ocean, and we can easily get lost. For example, for fishermen to cross the boundaries without realizing they are crossing uh, the boundaries. And then the next one is we. Uh, of course, all of these uh, uh, marine uh, ships or uh, uh, fishermen ships already have uh, some kind of, of uh, positioning technologies uh, on on board of their ship, and uh, the uh, one of the uh, part of the uh, special positioning uh, method on their ship is also related to uh, area that are uh, not allowed for them to cross over and especially about uh, uh, country boundary. So yes, uh, they, we also have uh, some kind of the uh, benchmark on the sea. Yeah, but I do not know uh, whether this uh, benchmark is uh, as robust uh, as we have on the land, or uh, maybe it needs to be changed uh, regularly. I have no idea about this. Maybe uh, you can ask Pandi who have more uh, information on this. I can probably add a little bit more. Any of you yeah. allow me? Yeah. Uh, Adani, Adani was correct about this, about the buoy, but uh, we can imagine that it is uh, almost impossible for us to have this, a lot of buoys in, buoys in, in the ocean. So that's why uh, we rely more actually on the coordinates. So that's why to uh, to observe or monitor the border crossing in the ocean, it is not as easy as on land because we have these pillars and everything. So we rely on this geospatial technology, which in this case is a positioning like GNSS or maybe more known as GPS, right? So that's why uh, you, whether or not you cross the border, nobody can actually judge without the proper technology that we have. So that's why our patrolling officer, they really have to have this uh, GPS on them. So if not, and then uh, they cannot really judge that. So yeah, that's probably my addition. Thank you, Danny. Thank you so much, Brandy. That's I hope that answered your question, Professor. Okay, thank you so much, Mary. All right. Uh, the next one, we have a lot of questions uh, in the chat box. The first one coming from Amirul Shafiq Jamsar. Hi, Padani. My name is Amirul. My question is, does geospatial give a huge threat against privacy since the data is accessible to everyone, like through Google Maps? Is there any relevance in restricting these activities from possibility of invasion of privacy? Thank you. Uh, this is a very interesting question. So uh, the first thing is about uh, location privacy. Uh, is it a huge threat, like you said, and then uh, the second one is, uh, is everyone able to access uh, the data? And the first one is, uh, is uh, location privacy matters? Yes, it is matters uh, because uh, privacy is privacy. And yeah, there's a reason why uh, if, uh, when we install a new app into our phone, then uh, it asks our permission, whether we allow uh, the app to have our location or not, because yeah, uh, location privacy is one of the uh, most important uh, properties about us. Uh, people could uh, figure out we are uh, currently at the office or we are sleeping at our home, or we are going away in our car, for example. And there's a lot of uh, unimaginable things that people can do with those information. So uh, location privacy is important. And uh, uh, the second one is regarding to whether everyone able to access the app. Yeah, uh, fortunately uh, for the moment, I do not know that uh, 
there are methods for everyone to access everyone else's uh, location without having uh, the account of uh, yeah for example if you mention google maps if i have uh, your google maps account then i will be able to uh, tell precisely where you are for the last uh, 24 hours and this is of course uh, uh, part of the privacy that needs uh, some concern and unfortunately uh, currently there are no uh, serious discussion about this about the uh, location privacy uh, we usually if we install uh, apps on our phone or games or uh, yeah any apps uh, for that matter uh, which ask for uh, location uh, permission we just uh, give the permission without uh, further thinking and uh, uh, some countries actually ban uh, the uh, utilization of this data and to uh, what is it to anonymize the data. So, for example, uh, what I uh, know is uh, the one that I mentioned earlier about the Europe. They have a, a limitation on how uh, the data, the particularly uh, individual data or as I said earlier about uh, personal <clears throat> personal positioning, the the company having this data are not allowed to uh, share this data for a visualization purpose, which depicts uh, individual location. So they need to have some kinds of uh, ab uh, abstraction on the data so that uh, the location is not the exact location. Yes, uh, this is very uh, interesting, and yeah, we need more discussion about this. And uh, we need also some policy from the policymaker about uh, how uh, the apps or uh, anyone who have the data of our location uh, are allowed to share or to process the data uh, so that uh, we can limit what uh, was uh, possible with uh, all of this data. Yeah, thank you for the uh, question. I hope that uh, answers your question. Okay, next question is from Robert Sanders. Maybe this is the same question uh, just like before, uh, but uh, Mr. Sanders already gave an example like when building meta universe maps, does the consent of all property owners featured there therein need to be secured? Yeah, this is also uh, the things about privacy of uh, geospatial data. So, uh, for example, if you went to uh, Foursquare or if you went to Google, uh, you can see that there are a lot of people sharing their photos without realizing that a third party, uh, yeah, I, what I uh, about to say, what I'm about to say is a utopia, but yeah, it could exist in a real world scenario. So, for example, uh, we have a photo of uh, a buildings buildings in Rome, uh, the amphitheater of Rome, for example. Uh, there are a lot of tourist photos of this uh, location, of this particular location. And then uh, some uh, third party researcher collect all these uh, photos from the internet and then uh, gather all of these photos and uh, they conduct some analysis so that they, they build the, the digital version of this uh, location. We also have, uh, for example, if that uh, what I mentioned earlier is uh, a tourism spot. Uh, and what about uh, personal property? What about personal uh, property? Can we uh, prevent uh, someone to take the picture of our apartment, for example? Uh, please don't take the picture uh, of this apartment. Uh, we can't uh, exactly do that at the moment. Uh, especially, uh, there are a lot of uh, things that uh, are already capturing our uh, the image of our uh, daily street, we have um, uh, CCTV everywhere. And then we also have a camera that are attached to our cars. We have the LiDAR on top of our cars, our uh, self-driving car. So this is uh, really, really hard to preserve the privacy of these uh, uh, things. And uh, another scarier thing is that um, uh, regarding to yeah, but I don't think this is uh, the correct place to discuss this. Um, uh, an augmented reality apps uh, could actually collect your uh, the so-called key points uh, or uh, the uh, important points of your room. For example, if you use uh, an augmented reality apps on your room, 
uh, and then uh, the apps will be able uh, if you are willing to share the data if you uh, they are will they will be able to collect the uh, key points uh, which will then uh, be used to construct a point cloud of your uh, room but yeah this is a scary uh, implementation of this uh, technology but yeah for the moment i don't know if we can uh, do uh, something to prevent this uh, unless we uh, we ourselves are uh, aware of our uh, privacy and not to share our uh, vicinity uh, not to uh, easily uh, for example share uh, uh, giving permission to a location uh, that are asked by apps that are installed uh, to our uh, cell phone for example yeah uh, this is uh, really interesting and yeah i think uh you can elaborate more by uh, 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 googling on the issue on the internet there are a lot of discussion regarding to this uh, location privacy uh, at the moment okay uh the next question comes from nadia tujana hi mr Ndani. i am nadia you had mentioned about there are some companies that got data from people through their mobile phone. Actually, this thing is likely to interfere with personal matter of people. My question is, uh, is there any possibility that uh, there are companies use this matter without the knowledge of their user? Yeah, thank you. Actually, the question is uh, quite similar to the previous two questions. Uh, is there a company that already already uh, use this kind of data for uh, for their purpose and without the consent of the user? Yes, there are. Yes, there are. And uh, uh, the guilty part, uh, the killed party have already been uh, uh, what is it? Uh, brought to uh, the. Uh, brought uh, to the front of the law yeah uh, at least uh, the one that i know is the i mentioned earlier in my slide about uh, a company that use their uh, a very precise location of uh, their users and then yeah uh, they intend to do good about the data they they try to uh, have a simulation of uh, people walking uh, and then uh, the possibilities of uh, uh, COVID spreading yeah. in the public area. Yeah, but they are doing the wrong things by uh, sharing the map with the location of the users. And this is uh, something that is against the law in Europe, in some part of the Europe, and they are already uh, uh, have to pay some, uh, some amount of fine to uh, the government because of this. And then they had to take down the uh, website uh, mentioning the information so you can find uh, the information right now and yes uh, this is uh, this happened uh, in the past and it is uh, very possible if this is also happen uh, in the future i can mention uh, one case that is uh, particularly um, maybe uh, familiar with all of us uh, maybe in indonesia we have uh, an apps that store our precise location and we need to activate the apps if we want to travel by plane and yeah we we don't know whether they have uh, the um yeah uh, limitation for by our government regarding to the data collected uh, by these apps by this app for example uh, uh, i i also don't know more information about this but yeah, uh, they declare that the data are used for their uh, for the purpose of uh, information for the government, but this is part of a uh, privacy. And unfortunately, not much people realize that uh, the location privacy is privacy, and it is important to to keep it uh, to us. So, as for my case, I uninstalled the app uh, once I uh, came down the airplane. Yeah, the, this is this is just uh, a paranoid part of having the uh, location uh, technology on our head. Yeah, thank you for the question. Okay, next one is coming from 
Abdul Hakim Ahmad Turmizi. Hi, Mr. Nadani. I'm Hakim from USIB. Indonesia is popular as an archipelagic state. How does this technology can help in coordinating archipelagic sea land passage in Indonesia? Other than that, will this technology capable of to coordinate safe to avoid an area which have a lot of pollution or major damage area in transit passage, such as in Malacca Strait or Singapore Strait? Maybe that's all. <clears throat> yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Hakim, for the question. And yeah, I can also say that uh, Pak Andi will have uh, some more fruitful discussion on this matter. <laughs> okay, and but uh, I'll try to answer as far as I'm, I uh, acknowledge of. So uh, how can the geospatial technology helps our uh, Indonesia? Indonesia is uh, an archipelagic state. Yeah, for example, for uh, guiding the ship, uh, guiding ships uh, to the uh, land passage in Indonesia. Uh, actually, I have mentioned in my uh, presentation earlier that, um, yeah, Pandi also mentioned earlier that uh, we can rely on GPS coordinates uh, on the sea. We have nothing, yeah, we have nothing to uh, uh, figure out or coordinate uh, other than, yeah, of course. Uh, the digital technology we have gps and we also have yeah traditional technology yeah, positioning by stars for example yeah but uh we can have uh, this uh, digital uh, objects such as the archipelagic archipelagic state uh lane the lane passage and then uh, the area with uh, contaminants or uh, like i mentioned in my slide um area which is um, uh, restricted for ordinary ship to pass through. Yeah, this is all uh, something that have uh, digital boundaries and digital boundaries mean GPS coordinates and we can input these GPS coordinates to the ship so that uh, the ship will be uh, will uh, aware, will be aware of this location and then uh, the captain of the ship will uh, decide where to uh, go to based on these coordinates. Uh, Pandi, please correct me if I'm wrong, I'm not. Uh, really acknowledge about this issue. <laughs> I can probably add a little bit. Um, I think you're, you're correct about this. Uh, in in general, I think Hakim also understands this. So we have a system of BMS, vessel monitoring system, which means it, this is quite. This is not a secret. This is not a, like a top secret. This is like, like a quite a general technology. Almost every country would have it. And there is an agreement between countries actually uh, across the world how a vessel is identified by a number that can be identified by this vessel monitoring system so meaning that if you go for example to marine traffic.com i'll just i'll just uh, do it here marine sorry marine traffic.com if you can check that uh, this is actually a real time uh, monitoring system of vessel in the world. So using the similar technology, it is possible for one country to basically observe and monitor uh, the movement of vessel in the world. However, uh, in this case, we always talk about uh, when or if everybody is in compliance to the law. So if, for example, there are vessel uh, from with uh, bad intention, of course, they will turn off their a machine or sorry turn off their uh, system which means that it is not uh, easy for us to identify so that is a different story but basically in general we have the system called uh, v, uh, vms and also there is uh, something called vin a vessel identifier uh, numbers which somehow connect them. so if you uh, pay attention to this marinetraffic.com so basically in in real time we can see what happens around the sea so we think sometimes we think that the ocean is really quiet. It is not really. It is like very, very uh, crowded. It is like it is. It is more than a, a, a traffic jam. So if you check that uh, website I just mentioned in the chat, I think you can have an idea how busy our uh, ocean is. And that first and second, we actually have the system. If I know once again, I can really tell you that this uh, can guarantee the safety and the uh, uh, security in the ocean. 
I hope that uh, adds something to what Dani just mentioned. Thank you so much, Hakim. Dani, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Pani. I'm always the student of Pani, so <laughs> no. I want to hesitate to ask you. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay. Um, is there any question coming from the participants? Okay. Uh, once again, I want to remind you that uh, uh, you can ask uh, you can, by writing down your question at box and or maybe you can just raise your hand and then open your microphone. There is one question I, I saw that. Is it? Okay. The thing is yours. Oh. Yeah, uh, there's a question in the uh, chat, chat box. Um, oh, okay. Oh, okay. Uh, this one is coming from Juridina Hasanin. Hasni. Uh, I'm sorry for my wrong pronunciation of your name. Good afternoon, Mr. Dani. My question is that is that does geospatial technology also involve in obtaining weather forecast information? If so. How does it is being obtained? Perhaps brief process on what kind of technology used? Yeah, thank you for the uh, question. This is interesting. Uh, and yeah, weather forecast is one of the, one of the interesting uh, magic <laughs> of our centuries because uh, we, can, we can predict what will happen. Okay, uh, tomorrow uh, there will be rain at uh, uh, 13 p.m. in Indonesia, for example. Yeah, uh, so uh, what uh, kind of special technologies involved in a weather forecast? Yeah, uh, I can mention one uh, very prominent technologies, which is remote sensing. So earlier I uh, mentioned about some uh, kinds of uh, satellites that can be used to monitor uh, the border, but there are actually a lot of kinds of satellites. They are the one with a very high resolution where we can see uh, uh, the, the top of our car, for example, and some others have a lower resolution. And this is uh, particularly true for, uh, for example, the weather uh, satellite data. So there are also uh, satellites that uh, monitor our uh, weather uh, 24 hours uh, in all parts of the world. Uh, for example, one of these kinds of satellite is uh, NOAA satellite, NOAA satellite, and uh, they inform the movement, for example, of a thunderstorm, and then uh, they also monitor the wind, uh, the speed of the wind, and they also monitor uh, the different temperature, and by all this information, we can predict, uh, for example, if tomorrow, uh, uh, today, uh, this uh, particular area have a uh, high possibility of rain uh, based on uh, this parameter and this parameter, etc. Uh, so yeah, there's uh, a very high uh, uh, utilization of this special technology for predicting uh, weather. And yeah, this is uh, very interesting and thank you for your question. Okay. Thank you so much for the question. Uh, there is no other question coming from the participants. Maybe, uh, Mr. Lasona, I want to ask a question. Uh, we, are, we are talking about geospatial technology for border management. My question is, what are, what are the challenges for today's geospatial technology to determine and manage border between two or more countries? Yeah, uh, I'm Thank sorry, you. I, I uh, kind of missed uh, the last part of your question, Vincent. Oh, okay, uh, I, I'm, going, I'm going to repeat my question. What are the challenges for today's geospatial technology to determine and manage border between two or more countries? Yeah, uh, actually the challenge for geospatial technologies is not as, as urgent as uh, the other uh, things related to border. Uh, that's uh, uh, actually in my opinion, because uh, technology is technology. Yeah, it is a uh, double-edged sword. It is uh, mm. uh, something that you can use for for the 
betterment of society, for example, and something that we can uh, uh, use for the uh, the otherwise uh, uh, not so good intention. So, yeah, technology is always there to help you to, for example, manage your border. And the challenge is uh, is there. You know, there are challenges everywhere, but yeah, uh, there are always ways to uh, manage to use this uh, technology for yeah for a lot of purposes. And yeah, uh, my opinion is that uh, uh, the geospatial technology is um, yeah it is is it can be used uh, for all these uh, purposes. We can say that uh, in some area, uh, for example, the challenge may be related to the uh, preparedness of technology in the area. And uh, we can uh, also mention that uh, maybe it is related to hum human resources. And there are also policies uh, related to uh, special boundary delimitation and demarcation. And that is uh, the concern because, uh, yeah, uh, in this case, just special technology is a tool that helps uh, helps to uh, identify the border and then to map the location and then to pinpoint the accurate location and it's already there and yeah uh, please correct me again if I'm wrong <laughs> and uh, 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 up to today we already have uh, seen a lot of implementation of just special technology for this uh, use case and yeah of course there are a lot of uh, potentials for the future we can uh, develop uh, some devices. Yeah, yeah. The the question is about the willingness to participate or not. Yeah. Just like Andy said. Maybe I can add something. Uh, I just would like to. I'm, I'm not really sure if Danny already mentioned about the something that he developed. We call the smart city. Uh, so basically, uh, others also question about. For example, Hakim also even question about. How can we use ge uh, geospatial data uh, technology to identify or manage or monitor, right? So uh, Danny and I and our group actually develop a system, basically uh, just to identify the zones in the ocean. Like for example, in Ind Indonesia, right? We have a so large ocean. We have to identify using the systems, which area is, for example, for fisheries, which areas is for protected areas, which areas is for tourism, something like that. So there will be a zone, different zones over there. The problem is that in the ocean, we don't have fence, right? We don't have pillars, we don't have a sign. So basically the ocean is ocean. But in fact, those oceans are actually not the same. So there are space for fisheries, there is space for a military exercise, for example, there's space for anything. So we should develop, or we have actually helped the government to develop the system, uh, at, at least the initial stage, where uh, we can identify where is what. So meaning that when we use that system or when other people use that system, they will be able to identify if they go somewhere, uh, they'll understand, oh, this is actually for fisheries. I can fish here, but I cannot do something else. Or if they go somewhere else, they can identify, oh, this is actually for uh, area I cannot fish here something like that so basically this is actually the one one example how just well the special technology is used for uh, border management also but I think I agree with Danny it's it's about whether or not we are willing to participate first and second whether or not we have enough data for that right so system only is not uh, is not enough uh, but uh, uh, Mas Danny also mentioned about the democratization of data so meaning that we cannot really rely on the government only to collect the data and then and then uh, put it into system we cannot do that but we have to rely on uh, the crowd yet any or basically the the common people if uh, in land we have this uh, as open street map in the ocean we actually have an open sea so basically if you guys uh, go or cruise or whatever you want to do in the ocean if you find something you can actually put the data into that system uh, check later on opencmap.com .org. I forget. so that's basically the the idea terima kasih nama thank you thank you so much for insightful answers coming from both of you okay uh, we still have uh, about five minutes is there any 
a participant who wants to ask a question. I think uh, we can end this. Yes, we, we can end this. Okay, okay. What an insightful discussion we had today with uh, Mr. Laksono. I want to thank uh, Dr. Dani Pugu Laksono for for your time today and for giving us an excellent insight of how geospatial technology affecting border management. Hopefully, this discussion we had today will be beneficial for all of us, for all participants. Please give your biggest applause to Mr. Lasson. Thank you. Thank you for helping me, Vincent. Good evening, good job. Thank you. Hey, now we are approaching to the end of this lecture. Again, I want to thank all participants who have participated in this lecture. I'm sorry if there is any wrong wrongdoing, both in my actions or my statements as a moderator. Thank you so much for being so active and for having me as a moderator. And I will give the stage back to Yama. See you anytime soon. Thank you, Vincent. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Vincent, for moderating this session. Uh, before we end this session, I would like to give the highest appreciation to our speaker. On behalf of UGM and USIM, I would like to present this certificate to Mr. Danny Puku Lapsono. Thank you, Danny. Good job. Thank you. Thank you, Pak Andi. Thank you, all the uh, participants. Thank you, Mr. Laksono, for a great session today. Before we end today's session, I hope all participants can join in photo session. Yeah, everyone, please turn on your camera. I will take uh, our picture. There are two slides, so please get yourself all a smile. Okay, we'll start from slide one. Okay, I'm waiting for everyone to turn on your camera. Oh, Dr. Hasmin is here. Thank you, Dr. Hasmin. <laughs> okay, I'll start from the slide one. Please always smile. One, two, and three. Okay, next slide. One, two, and three. Okay, next. One, two, and three. And then the last one. One, two, and three. Okay. All right. Thank, Thank you, Akram. Everyone. Thank you, Akram. This is the end of second day of ACL Team 2021. I would like to apologize for my misconduct, but in my action or statement as your master of ceremony. On behalf of the Department of Geodetic Engineering of UKM and the Faculty of Law Museum, thank you so much. Good afternoon and see you in the next week. Thank you. Bye bye, everyone. Thank you, Hasmi. Thank you. Thank you. Dani, thank you so much. Bye bye. Hey, thank you, everyone. See you. Gracias.